Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Like a Dog podcast, hosted by Andrea Paiva and Millie Travis. In this podcast, we discuss how to build the best relationship with your dog. From rescues to reactivity, we'll cover it all. Welcome back to Think Like a Dog podcast, and we are on episode seven today, and we're going to discuss bringing home a new dog. This is actually part three of the series we've been doing. So when there's so much that happens when you bring home a new dog, I mean, I get so many different things and, uh, you know, stories from people and it's, it's a big, you know, adjustment that happens with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially when you have another dog or, or more than one dog already at home. Um, and that's what we're really talking about today is how to introduce a new dog to housemates that you might already have. Um, on top of, we can cover a little bit of, of cats and, um, how that might work. The first thing with, um, bringing home a new dog and introducing them to, to your housemates is setting expectations and taking things a little bit slower than you would want or than you, uh, than your goal. Right. So most everybody's goal is to have the new dog and the current dog or dogs be best friends. That's everybody's goal. But the problem is you can't force a relationship. And if you go with that expectation too fast, we can kind of be, be forcing a fight. So the first thing that I always suggest Um, most people will take their current dog with them to the rescue or to wherever they're getting their new dog from and have that introduction there. A couple little tips for that. I mean, it's the same thing that I would do when I, when I'm bringing them home too, but I never do ever face to face interactions on leash or face to face greetings on leash Mm -hmm. in their world. That is, I mean, very bad manners. You'll see puppies kind of do that to adult dogs. You'll see, um, you know, uh, maybe more happy go lucky forward dogs do that. Uh, but it is a very rude way of greeting each other on top of, I don't do on leash introductions because a lot of times people are putting a lot of tension on the leashes. So that can kind of be signifying to the dogs that it's a little bit of a mixed signal. So we can, we can really force a fight there. One, one thing that I would say is bring your dog there and then just your goal. My goal would be that they don't care about each other. That would be my goal. I would hope that I can bring a dog in there and they don't immediately play because if they immediately play, then I'm already out the window. Uh, They don't care about me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm no longer relevant. They don't care. Um, and I have no way of controlling that play when it gets a little bit too rough. My goal would be that they walk in there and they're like, cool, a dog. Yeah. It really doesn't change my life too much or too little. So that's that, that would be my first kind of what I'm looking for when I bring my dog, my current dog or dogs with me to the rescue to meet the new dog. Bringing them home is a whole other thing. And you're going to see things like with when you brought home, Bubbles home, everything was great yeah. for a little while, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you kind of bring them in and everything was great and everything's great for a little while, that doesn't immediately mean that there's never going to be problems. It took a month before... Yeah, it was um, maybe even over a month that it really started, that the first fight happened and, you know, that he got a little bit more comfortable. And um, I get so many stories all the time from people reaching out to the rescue that they adopted this dog and now they fought the resident dog or they don't like the cat, you know, and then their only option they feel like is, oh, now I need to rehome. This dog doesn't work for our family. Right. Right. And just like you can bring your new dog home and everything is fine for the first month or so, you can also bring your new dog home and and then everything after everything being fine, maybe something changes or um, something is growing and whatever. Right. And now we see a fight or we see an issue that we didn't have the first day that we brought them home. We can also have the opposite situation where maybe your dog and the new dog don't love each other right off, right off the bat. Um, maybe they are growling at each other. Maybe they, um, have gotten into it or whatever. And I'm not saying that this is every time, but there are ways to make sure that, um, we are growing a healthier relationship. If that first off introduction doesn't go very well, that doesn't mean it's, it's a no go, right? Um, it means that there's going to be some work that's required and you bring your new dog home and maybe they kind of notice the cat and all of a sudden they kind of lunge for it. 
that that can be a, a big issue or it could be something to work on. Um, so that first interaction is important, but it doesn't speak to what you can create. Um, so you bring your new dog home and just for the sake of it, an example, let's say you only have one other dog. And for the sake of that example, we'll say you have one cat as well. The first thing that you are going to do, you are not going to just bring that dog into your home with your other dog already in there off leash. One, your other dog has no way of expecting that there's going to be another dog walking in. Two, the new dog has no idea where they are. The first thing that you are want, or you're going to want to do is walk them together. The reason that you want to walk them together is not so that we get some exercise in them. Yes, that is a a huge benefit of it, but you're setting the tone for, hey, there's another dog right here, but I am in control of this dog. And I, and to the new dog, you are going to be saying, hey, there's this dog over here. Yes, I know this dog, but I make the decisions for this dog. So neither one of you guys need to worry about the other one being a threat. You also don't need to worry about the other one controlling resources. So taking them out on a walk in in a neutral-ish territory like your neighborhood, it is going to be super beneficial. But the goal of that walk is not that they're interacting and sniffing and playing. It's that you are moving and, and they're moving with you and you're leading and they're following. You're setting the tone for how that relationship is going to go through the course of their lives. And that's yeah. very important. And when you bring a new dog home, should you pl- first create the resident dog, then create if you're not able to immediately take them on a walk, how would that go? Yeah. Um, that one's tough. I mean, if you're not able to immediately walk them, I hesitate to say the crate because if your dog, let's say your dog isn't crate trained, then that's not fair. Right. Yeah. Um, then the crate is, is just becoming like this holding cell for, uh, something that they can no longer control, which is a new dog coming into their home. Um, but if, if you're not able to walk them, I would say we need to make sure that we have somebody to help you walk them or we have somebody there holding the other dog on a leash so we can kind of communicate a little bit better. Um, the only time that I will ever say, uh, that crating is your best option for introduction is when you're bringing home a tiny little baby puppy, right? And you've got an adult dog. Okay. So my goal for that is you put the puppy in the crate, the new dog, new puppy in the crate, and your goal or your, what, what I want to see is the older dog or the larger dog, whatever the, the current dog, not care at all about the puppy, but what a lot of people do when I have given them that advice is they'll put the puppy in the crate and they'll kind of, they'll grab the current resident dog and they'll be like, look, look at the puppy. But my, I don't want that. I, I want the, it's great if the dog doesn't care about the puppy. That's your best bet on top of you're teaching the puppy, hey, not everything is here for you to interact with. Um, and, and you're really advocating for your adult dog in that moment. Um, but yeah, my, my first uh, go-to is always going to be a walk, even if it's not a dog that you're adopting, but maybe it's your friend is coming over and they're bringing a dog with them, go on a walk together. And your, your goal is always that they don't care about each other. It's always neutrality. And then you work from there. Okay. So after that walk, would it be okay to let them off leash and let them interact? Would that be the the best? It depends. Um, I would say if you are, um, if you're a little bit unsure or maybe this is maybe only your second dog you've ever owned or the current dog that you have has some reactivity issues or is dog selective. Um, I would say, no, we're going to take that even slower, but let's say you, you know that the dog that you are adopting is coming from a foster and that foster says that every dog that that dog has ever met is perfect with other dogs or whatever. Um, and your dog is, has, has a really good social socialization skills, then yes, let's, let's do a little bit of interacting, but let's maybe keep the new dog's leash dropped or at least in your hand. So you've got something to enforce direction with. Um, but most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time we're not adopting the perfect dog with perfect, perfect social skills. And the dog that we already own is not perfect. Um, wouldn't it be nice though? So what I I would say is you're going to bring them in and either crate them both side by side or you're going to place them both kind of maybe not right next to each other, but get them. The goal is coexisting before mm-hmm. we get them to love each other, because on one end, if they love each other too much, then once again, they forget you exist. They forget you're in the room and you have no way of controlling interactions if they become if they become 
too rough or um, maybe unsafe for either your furniture or themselves or the people around them while they're playing. Or let's say they become a little disrespectful and then a fight breaks out and maybe you knew that that was going to happen at a level seven, but you didn't have control over that. So then all of a sudden it went to a level 10 and you, you couldn't stop it yeah. because we immediately let them start interacting. So my goal, the first probably week, two weeks is a lot of direction, a lot of it to make sure that whatever happens, if they're going to love each other, hate each other, not care about each other, you have the ability to control it and to keep everybody safe. Yeah. So after that first walk, you know, that's a really important step to get them to understand each other, understand the presence of each other and that you're still leading that relationship. And now with rules after that introduction, a lot of people, even if the dogs do get along pretty well, they follow the same schedule or the same lifestyle as when they had the first dog. So if you were free feeding your first dog, then you get the second dog, they get along, you do that with the second dog as well. Now, how would you say about the rules and boundaries that you're going to set for this relationship now that, that you have two dogs, right, you know, right? or even just one, and you never had a dog, how would you start setting these rules and boundaries in your yeah. home? Yeah, I mean, we talked about that in the last um, episode of what the first month really looks like, um, and, and ways to uh, to make sure that we are creating a healthy relationship that we can enjoy throughout our dog's life. Now, that is a lot easier, actually, if we only have one dog. Now, let's say we have a current dog, though, that is allowed on furniture and has earned that. Um, and it, it doesn't, you know, my current dog maybe said doesn't sleep in the crate uh, or I don't close the door um, and is free fed. I would never really free feed, but it's making sure that your new dog that comes in, how do I give that structure to a new dog while also making sure that I'm not sort of making my current dog think that they're punished, right? Mm -hmm. um, on top of how do I advocate for my current dog if my current dog is annoyed sometimes with the new dog or the new puppy or whatever it is. So the first thing that I want to cover is it's okay for your dog, you to have different rules and boundaries based on the relationships that you have with your dog. We talked about that. I think last time as well, Kane has different rules and boundaries because you have a different relationship with him, um, than, than you do with bubbles since bubbles yeah. is pretty new ish. Now, that, though, requires you to be very honest with yourself about what your relationship is like with your current dog. If you bring a new dog home and you are worried about your current dog having reactivity issues with your new dog, then you might not have the relationship that you think that you do. And, and it might be best for everyone involved to make sure that we put everybody on the same playing field. So I really, if I ever have, you know, housemates that fight, whether they've lived together forever or not, I love making sure that everybody is on the same page. So both dogs sleep in the crate right next to each other. They both eat in the crate. They both have structured feeding times. They both have all the same rules. Nobody's allowed on furniture. And if you're even a little bit worried, I would say make sure that we, we control all the resources rather than taking that chance, especially if you're dealing with large breeds and you live alone, you don't want to break up a fight by yourself. You don't, yeah. it's dangerous. Yeah. And, um, having those two dogs in the same level just helps them also understand that they're both on the same level as well when it comes to rules and boundaries. Right. I think that's pretty important to keep large breed dogs in that mindset. So you're never stuck in that position. I mean, I was stuck in a position where I had to, um, you know, I had to see a fight in front of me and thankfully I had help. Ozzy was able to come in last time, Kane and Bubbles fought but it's definitely a very, very scary situation. And if you don't have the right resources, something to get their attention, to get them to split up, you're in a really bad place. Um, now, when you are, you know, practicing with them to turning their intense play on and off, because obviously they're going to play, they're going to interact. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. If, if it gets to that point, um, and it did get to that point with Kane and Bubbles where they were playing, but it got really intense and we never turned it off. So it turned into a fight. Right. So how, how do you, when your dogs get to the first introduction, they do well, they do get to play. 
how important is it and how do you control that intense play and turn them on and off in that mindset? Yeah, I mean, so that goes back to the whole why it's so important to control resources, not only and this is basically the last episode, not only when we are bringing a new dog home um, by themselves, but especially when we are bringing a new dog home and we already own a dog. It is so important to control resources because if we don't, then we are not seen as somebody who is able to control the any anything anything. So whether we're out on a walk and we see something we've never seen before, um, our dog isn't going to look to us for direction. When we are playing with our housemate and maybe we get a little bit too rough or the other housemate gets a little bit too rough, our dog isn't going to listen when we try to call them off. It's, it, we're not setting ourselves up to be somebody that, that can keep our dog safe when it does get to that level, if it does. Now, practically, how do we do that? A leash. Uh, the leash is your ultimate enforcer. So your, um, I know you have a couple of our, our 12 foot leads. So what we practice a lot at day camp is allowing a dog to maybe go out and have an introduction or, um, start playing, um, for our dogs that are still learning their social skills. And then we, we kind of look and see, okay, well, the other dog is tense or this dog is getting tense and we've become almost like the referees. So, Mm -hmm. um, we kind of judge and see, okay, who's, is this a healthy social interaction or is it not? And then we will say whoever, let's say it's Kemper, we'll say Kemper come. And at the same time, we'll enforce with the leash, pull them back. Um, and then make sure that we have as close to perfect of a recall as possible, because that is how I get my dog out of I mean, a lot of, of troublesome situations that either they could create or that they could be, um, on the other side of recall is, is your, your biggest, your biggest command. If you're going to learn anything and we're going to have an entire episode with, um, with Jillian, one of our, our last assistant trainer that nobody's met yet, um, on recall and the importance of that, because it gets your dog out of so many tough situations without having to utilize only corrections. Yeah. And you know what I've seen a lot of lately is people bringing home a new dog and later they find out they don't really do well with the cats. Yeah. And I think that's crazy. I mean, like to expect a dog to just instantly be okay with a cat if they've never seen a cat. I mean, Kane is a great dog. Yeah. But he's trauma. Like he doesn't really do well with cats. Like one time he, the first time he saw a cat, he was at our groomer's. And she said she has a cat and the cat just walked by and she said Kane literally screamed. She's like, I never heard a dog scream before, but he screamed. So <laughs> I um, I saw uh, something on Facebook yesterday. It was a dog that we really advocated for. And we um, she was part of the 100 Club that we sponsored their, their adoption fees, uh, our foundation does. And she was adopted to this home in Alabama. And someone sent me a post that that family is now on Facebook trying to rehome her mm. because she doesn't like the cats, but she does what really well with a resident dog. They play perfectly together, but um, they say their cat safety come first and, you know, they, they have to rehome her. So I've gotten that at least, I mean, since we opened the rescue numerous times, I can't even count how many times I've seen people say, this dog doesn't like cats. I can't do it. So yep. How would you introduce a dog and a cat? How would that go? Yeah, so that's, okay. So I look at this from a couple different angles. One, cats are smaller. Um, they are they don't speak the same language as dogs. Yep. Uh, completely different species. So I look at this in terms of uh, it is a there's a high risk level here, okay? Especially if I own a large breed dog and a cat, and, and especially if that cat is a kind of a little bit of a fraidy cat. So if that cat likes to run, um, then that is going to trigger prey drive in our dog. So that's my first thing is I have to be aware of the safety issue of this uh, uh, and how easy it would be for this cat to get hurt. Second part of this is I look at, well, what are the skills that my dog already has? So if I'm bringing home a new dog and my dog is, I don't know if my dog is crate trained or if my dog has um, the ability to stay in a place or has the mindset of, okay, when I'm in this space, I don't, you know, I don't exist and, and nobody bothers me. This is my no confrontation zone and I get to just turn my brain off here. If my dog does not have those skills, then I cannot ask my dog to just chill out when I bring the cat in, if there was a feeling about that cat, 
right? Mm -hmm. So my first step is teach the skills, teach coping mechanisms, because I cannot guarantee you that even if your dog likes small dogs, that your dog is going to be cool with cats. I can't, it's a whole different story. Okay. Now I also cannot guarantee that if you bring your dog, your cat in and your dog um, has a feeling, if you haven't really practiced these coping mechanisms, that your dog is going to be able to turn that off, right? At least for a while without you kind of grabbing the collar or the leash or whatever. So your first goal is to teach these coping mechanisms for an impulse control and boundaries and all of that. It goes back to making sure that day in and day out, you are living as somebody who makes the decisions for your dog so you can keep everybody safe, including your dog, and that you become believable when your dog has a huge feeling like the cat, okay? If they were to have that feeling. Now, let's say you've done that. It's been a few months and your dog goes to place and just melts and turns their brain off and is loves their crate and uh, looks to you for direction in all these other ways. And the reason that I want that to be done first before we really introduce the cat is because there is that high level safety, right? There is that high level risk is, is uh, really the problem. There's such a size difference. Um, I want to make sure we take things slow. Now, the way that I do that is... I bring the cat in in some sort of enclosure, okay? And then I practice recall off of the cat. So the first time that I do that, whether it's like a baby gate that the the cat cannot jump over, whatever it is, right? I am practicing, okay, yep, you can go out and sort of smell and then I'm going to call you back in and then I'm going to place you or whatever it is. It's not going to be, you're just going to get to go up and, and have some sort of interaction with the cat and I'm not going to have any sort of say over what that interaction looks like. It's the same thing that we do in day camp with other dogs. When we're learning, those dogs are learning social skills. It's just, I take it so much slower with cats, so much slower. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like you said, they're two different species. So for people to really expect a dog to just see a cat and be totally fine with it, it's, it's crazy to me, but Um, it's, you know, I think there is still that fun, the fundamentals that you have to build with your dog, like you said, to get them to that calm mindset so they can trust you and trust that you're making these decisions for them. And it all goes back to what we talked about on previous episodes. It's making the decisions for your dog. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, even with some posts that we post on Instagram, everybody's freaking out. Oh, I like when my dog jumps on me, but I like sharing space with my dog. It's not about you sharing space with your dog or letting them jump on you. It's showing them that you have boundaries and that there are boundaries and things that you need to set for them to be able to respect that relationship like everything else. Yeah. I mean, if you don't practice having a say in a day to day relationship with your dog, you're not you're not going to have a say when it comes to your dog going after your cat. I mean, that's those are the people that Uh, inevitably I will get in for a session because they have not controlled resources. And when they try to put their foot down about something um, that most of the time is a safety issue to either another dog, a cat, people around them themselves, then the dog's going to look at them like, who, who do you think you are? You don't ever Mm -hmm. tell me what to do. So I think especially when it comes to smaller animals and especially when those smaller animals like cats are scared, that's going to trigger, uh, trigger like prey drive in our dogs. Now, The only kind of difference is when you have a very confident cat. If you have a confident cat, my, one of my cats is the most confident cat I have ever met in my life. She, every time I bring a new dog in, I make sure that that dog has place skills, put them on place and she will come and sit right in front of that dog. Normally that dog that is new is tethered to something. So I know that even if they do lunge, they are not going to get her right but she will sit there and just be like, this is, this is my house. I mean, I own all of this, right? Uh, Disclaimer, I don't know how to train cats. I only know how to train. (laughs) My cats absolutely believe that they own my house. Um, But if you have a a very scared cat, my other cat is very scared, he's going to run. And it's not my dog's fault if that triggers chasing. I mean, prey drive is just chasing a small object, moving away from them. That is instinctual to my dogs. And and there are certain breeds that that is more instinctual to, um, that are, are bred for that. But it's all about teaching ways to control those instincts before we ever have to use them. So we're not going to teach that and then just throw the cat in there the first time we teach it. Yeah. And a lot of people have to understand before you bring home a new dog, 
You have to be ready for the commitment that comes with it. And we talked about this before as well. You have to be able to think if that dog does not get along with a cat, if that dog does not like my resident dog, how are you going to lead that relationship from then on? You have to be ready to make changes. Once you bring home a dog, you're making a commitment to that dog. You're committing yourself to however they're going to react to different things in your life, whatever happens, you're going to be able to work with it. And that's what I really learned with Bubbles is I never experienced what I've experienced with bringing home a dog. They get in a fight. I don't know what to do, get confused. I never knew about boundary structure, any of that. And Bubbles forced me to really learn about that, mm -hmm. right? He's like, all right, you got to get your, your things together and learn how to deal with all this. You know, yeah. he really, he changed me for the better because I allowed him to. Yeah. I allowed him to let me see things differently and to see that I needed to change. So in order for him to change, and we talked about this too, once you bring home a dog, you allow him into your life and they're going to have likes and dislikes you're going to have to do with that. You're just yeah. going to have to roll with it and, and make changes and commit yourself. But I just hate when I see people bring home a new dog and then all of a sudden, this dog doesn't work for me. You know, they, I think the biggest theme that I see is they put so much human into it. So yeah. um, I see a lot of people who say my dog is jealous um, of the new dog or my new dog is jealous of my current dog um, or I feel bad for my, my current dog or my, my original um, dog because they're not getting as much t attention as they used to. You've got to take the human out of it and you have to realize that the first couple months, it might not be how you want it to be two years from now, a year from now, but your goal, you're working towards that. You're by, by not just forcing it, you are working towards how you want it to be. Yeah. So by controlling things, um, and limiting resources and making sure that you are somebody who the dog listens to, you are working towards being able to have your pack together, happy, healthy, playing, maybe not playing because that's up to the dog, but uh, coexisting healthily, safely, happily. But you have to put, there's going to be a few months of this at least that you're not going to get what you want out of the dog. So you can't go out to the shelter and get a dog because you want them to make you feel better. You go out to the shelter and get a dog to save that dog's life and to provide that dog with what that dog needs and while also advocating for your current dog. Exactly. You couldn't have said it better. You have to be able to really tell yourself, do you want to help a dog or do you just want a dog for your enter entertainment? Because if it's just for your entertainment, you're really not ready to have mm -hmm. any kind of living being in your life, right. you know? Um, but you have to commit yourself to long-term results rather than short-term fixes. Yeah. And once you do that, you're going to have a really fulfilling relationship with all of your animals, whether that be your cats or your dogs, and you, they can coexist. But I feel like people really need to see the bigger picture first. Yeah. I mean, your dog is not, your current dog is not jealous of your new dog. Your current dog has been taught that they own you. So your current dog is displaying some sort of behavior of, Hey, you've taught me for however many years that I'm in control of all of this. I own this. How dare you bring this new dog into my home? So cr controlling the resources helps make everybody's relationship healthier. And you, like you said, you are working towards a goal. It may not be fun at first, but it's, it's going to get you what you want in the end. Yeah. And one more thing that I think we should cover is when you bring a you bring home a, a resident dog, you, you know, they're, they're getting along. Once you leave the house, are you crating both of them or Absolutely. are you leaving one loose, the new one crated? How would you do that? I'm either crating both of them, but what I am absolutely doing is crating the new dog mm -hmm. every single time. I really don't like it. And I think that this is just a history of working in the vet industry and, um, you know, all these horror stories. I don't like leaving do dogs out together when I am not in that room with them, regardless of if those two dogs have lived together forever. I, I just, I cannot control what I am not around to see. I cannot mitigate any sort of, uh, arguments between them, control resources. If something falls, if somebody knocks on the door, I can't, I don't have a say cause I'm not there. And I just heard, horror story after horror story of dogs getting into fights when nobody is home and, and these dogs get very hurt because yeah. nobody's there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, you have to be able to create your dogs 
And it also goes back to setting the same boundaries for both of them and the same rules. Because then I think there's also that, um, you know, that relationship that once one dog is loose and the other one is, is in the crate, it might create some kind of unbalance. Jealousy. Yeah, unbalance and jealousy between both of them. Which I don't think is the case. I yeah. don't think that's the case because I think it's more, um, once again, you have different relationships with your dogs. When I got Kemper as a puppy, I had a 12-year-old senior lab. She was not crated when I left. He was because he's... I love him to death, but he's not very smart still. He's still created when I leave. Um, but I, I have to make, I'm not going to leave my puppy out with my 12 year old dog. He's going to annoy the heck out of her yeah. uh, on top of, he's going to eat my whole house. So you can have those, those different rules and boundaries. But if let's say you have your, like we said at the beginning, let's say your current dog or your original dog um, has reactivity issues, or you have a relationship based issue, or this isn't going as well as you'd hoped. Right? then create them both and put everybody on the same playing field. But if you have, if your new dog, um, if your current dog is doing okay, then just create the new one. That's fine. And your current dog, let's say has always been out of the house fine, or out in the house when you leave fine. But if you're, if you're struggling, everybody should be on the same playing field. And if you want to be extra safe, everybody should be in the same playing field. Yeah, I agree. Um, so today I feel like we covered a lot of information of bringing home a new dog and the fundamentals. And I think it, it as since it's part of a series, I mean, I re really advise everyone, if you're starting to listen to the podcast now, go back to episodes and start the series from there because it's building blocks. So we talk about um, the building blocks to get to this point of bringing home a new dog and introducing housemates. And um, do you want to add anything else, Millie? No, 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 I think we're all good. Awesome. So thank you so much for joining us today. And don't forget, practice makes progress. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Think Like a Dog Podcast and follow at Mirror Image Canine for training tips. If you have any questions, please reach out to us via email at info at thinklikeadogpodcast.com.